Hello and welcome back to Probability Theory. We've already reached part 18 in the series and we are still talking about the variance and the standard deviation. More precisely, today we will prove some important formulas that hold for independent random variables. However, before we start with this, a big thank you to all my supporters on Steady. You can also support this channel via PayPal or by other means mentioned in the description. And as a supporter, you have access to PDF versions and quizzes for all the videos. Okay, then let's start with the topic of today. Let's talk about some properties of the variance and the standard deviation. And as I said before, we will formulate this for two independent random variables x and y. Moreover, we already know from the last videos that the variance is only well defined if the integral of the random variable squared exists. Or in other words, the expectation of x squared has to be a finite number. And of course, the same we also need for the random variable y, which means the expectation of y squared has to be a finite number as well. Okay, with this we now know, the variance and the standard deviation of x and y exist. So all of these are well-defined real numbers. However, now we are also able to say something about the sum of the two random variables. More concretely, we can now calculate the variance of x plus y. And maybe it's not a big surprise for you, in this case the variance is indeed additive. This means we can simply pull out the plus sign here. However, here please don't forget, it's important that the two random variables here are independent. Okay, so this is the addition and now you might ask what happens when we scale a random variable. So the question is, what is the variance of lambda times x, where lambda is a real number? And in fact, we can pull out this lambda factor, but with a square. So we can simplify our variance here, but we shouldn't forget the square outside. Okay, now you might have the idea that we should formulate the second rule here for the standard deviation as well, because there the square should vanish in the definition. There, please recall, the standard deviation sigma of lambda times x is simply the square root of the variance. This means, indeed, here on the right hand side the square of lambda vanishes, but now we have the absolute value there. This makes sense because the standard deviation has to be always positive. Hence, also here, you should remember you can pull out a scalar from the standard deviation, but then you should forget about the minus signs. In other words, if you just look at positive numbers, this is a homogeneous property. Now I would say, all the three rules here you should remember, because you can use them in calculations. However, of course, first we should prove them. Indeed, this is not a hard proof, because we can immediately use the formula we have for the variance given by the expectations. This means the variance of x plus y is given by the difference of two expectations. Please recall, in the first one we have the square inside the expectation and in the second one outside. And now the good thing we can use here is that the properties of the expectation we have already discussed in part 15. In particular, we know the expectation is linear. And of course, this should be something that can help us here. However, first here let's expand the square inside the expectation. So this is x squared plus 2 times x times y plus y squared. So not so complicated and in the next step we can use the linearity here. Moreover, here on the right hand side we can use the linearity immediately. So we have the expectation of x plus the expectation of y. And still we have to square the whole thing. Okay, then in the next step let's use the linearity of the expectation here in the first part. So we can pull out the additions and the scalars. Hence first we have expectation of x squared plus 2 times the expectation of x times y plus the expectation of y squared. Okay, then on the other hand here on the second part we can expand the square as well. So this means first we have the expectation of x squared then minus 2 times the expectation of x times the expectation of y. And finally we have the squared expectation of y. 
Okay, at this point you should see, we can already put this term together with this term to get the variance of x. And in the same sense, this expectation here and that expectation there gives us the variance of y. So you see, we have already reached what we want here on the right hand side. Therefore, the only question is, what is with the two remaining terms here? So maybe first to answer this, let's put them together. So it's two times, then the expectation of x times y minus the expectation of x times the expectation of y. So at this point we know this whole term should be zero. And indeed, there the independence of the two random variables x and y comes in. Because if they are independent, then this expectation here is just a product of two expectations. That's also something we have stated in part 15. So the conclusion here is the whole term inside the parentheses here is zero. And this finishes the proof of part A. So now let's go to part B. In fact, part B is much easier because only one random variable is involved here. But again, we can use the formula with the expectations for the variance. So first we have the expectation where the random variable is squared and then we square the expectation. And now you should see, in both terms we can pull out a lambda squared. Again, simply by using the linearity of the expectation. Okay, and then the only thing we have to do now is to factor out the lambda squared. Because then only the difference of the two expectations remains. And we have used this formula so often now that you immediately see this is the variance of x. In other words, we have proven part b. And also, not a surprise at all, from part b we now can derive part c. Essentially, part c was the same thing, but now for the standard deviation instead of the variance. Hence, the only thing we have to do here is to take the square root of the variance. And then, by using part b, we see we have the square root of lambda squared. And indeed, this is simply now the absolute value of lambda. And the other factor is just the square root of the variance of x, which is the standard deviation of x. Okay, and with this you see, the whole proof is finished. So as I said, please remember all these properties, all the formulas here, because you can use them in calculations. And indeed, how to do that, we will see in the next videos. Therefore, I really hope that I see you there, and have a nice day. Bye!